FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and it is August, got hard to believe, August 16th, 2017, and almost done with the summer doldrums. But this summer has been anything less than dull, and it's going to heat up soon. Guarantee you that. Well, what's with the economy? We get retail sales coming in ahead of estimates. Can you believe it? And what about jobless claims? Well, the expert in jobless claims we know is Andrew Zatlin of MoneyballEconomics.com. Andrew, welcome back. Hey, Kerry. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. So, so there's retail sales. Something uh, fishy with that number, isn't there? You know, I'm a mechanic when it comes to this stuff, and and I I, I hate conventional data points because most of the time, yeah, they're like 60, 70, 80 years old, and the methodology by which they come up with these numbers, it would blow you away. It's it's the traditional. If you only knew how they made the sausages, you wouldn't eat one <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, yeah, you know, they got to do something, right? And governments are trying. And, and, and when you think about it, every month they've got to crank out a survey of, you know, they got to take the pulse of the U.S. economy once a month. This is a pretty big deal. It's it's hard, but I think they could do a better job. And I think yesterday's retail number just showed us how how dangerous we're getting to a place where the official data has disconnected so dramatically from what's really going on. And, you know, it's a slippery slope when you when you poke at one of these data points. I mean, you could you could start with inflation. You know, one of the things about inflation was if you looked at inflation, um, that came out last week, and everyone said, "Oh my gosh, inflation's pretty mild." No, let me correct that. If you look at the way they measure inflation, let me put my mechanics hat on here. I want to start with inflation, then do retail sales, talk a little bit about how these numbers are kind of making making everyone have the wrong understanding of what's going on in the economy. And so therefore, what should we focus on so that we as investors have the right data in our hands in a timely way? So inflation, the way they look at it, they say, yeah, we're going to kick out energy and food. You say, okay, that's fine. So of all the things they measure, that kicks out about 20% of the things they measure. So then when you hear CPI is this or CPI is that, typically they're looking at that number that's X energy and food. Okay, so that gives us 80% of the things they measure. They then kick out another 19% because those are those are commodities. So to net it out, you've got 80% of which 20% is commodities, 60% is services. Now, here's the thing. If you look at commodities, we've got Chinese deflation. Everything that China makes and sells to us is constantly falling in price. So when they looked at commodities, they said, oh, look, commodities are falling in price. Well, they've been falling in price for a couple of years now, thanks to China. Appliances, bikes, clothes, we import all that stuff. It's services where you really get the feel for what the U.S. economy is doing because you, know, you, you, you can't substitute a doctor here for a doctor in China. So here's the interesting thing. Every single service item went up dramatically, surging, accelerating inflation. You're talking 60% of all the things that are measured, 60% of the 80% of the things that matter to the Fed. Everything went up with one exception. And the, this is the one thing that brought down inflation where everyone said, oh my gosh, we don't have inflation. Cell phones. According to the people who measure CPI, cell phone bills dropped 14% year over year, and they've been dropping at that rate for the past year. Now, Kerry, I'm sorry, but I'm not seeing my AT&T cell phone bill go down. In fact, it's always going up. So you've got a methodology problem here. When you start lifting up the hood and poking around, you realize this is garbage. It's garbage data that's influencing decisions, but it's still garbage data. And the same thing happened with retail yesterday. So retail comes out and everyone says, oh, this is great. Retail went up, you know, 0.6%. And this is great because the prior month it was practically 0%. And wow, consumers are out there spending. And I raise my hand. I say, no, 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 no. Let's start with the number one reason why retail went up is they identified this massive surge in car sales. Now, if, if you're alive, if you're able to breathe and you read any kind of media, you know that, in fact, auto companies are struggling. Choking, right you know, choking on the inventory, the channel oh stuffing God. and everything else. They don't know what the heck to do here, Andrew, with all the all the metal that they've got uh, on the yeah. lots. They can't move the metal. GM has some factory shutdowns. I mean, there's too much car out there, not enough buying. In fact, if you look at the government's own data from the BEA, no less, they said, let's, let's start with a couple of data points here to frame up why this is so ludicrous, how CPI is 
messy, but so is retail. And and so what isn't messy? Uh, retail sales, they said there's about $1.2 billion increase in auto sales. Huh. But their own data says that there were exactly 90,000 more cars sold from Ju- uh, June to July, only 90,000. But somehow that became 1.2 billion. And the other data point is the average car net price, retail price dropped. Um, the incentives more to incentives. a new high. Yeah, new in- yeah. more incentives. Uh, but the average car price actually went down. Yeah. The average transaction per right. unit went down because they've got too many cars out well, there. Well, look, Andrew, so, Andrew, like the average, I met some people, they had spent $65,000 on a Ford, tricked out Ford F-150. I mean, the profit margin on that vehicle has got to be the highest margin vehicle that Ford had, uh, other than uh, their huge trucks and you know like come on they've got a lot they took this opportunity of loosened credit standards to jack up the prices since you don't care because you're borrowing it anyway at such low interest rates and this Uh thing's got a boomerang at some point right let's talk about this okay so what i just presented cpi and retail uh the official conventional data is not reflecting the real world so what does that mean it means two things it means number one decisions are being made by the federal reserve and by others based on flawed data which is good if you're an investor because the second part is we're going to know better all right so the opportunity to be in the right position because you're going to have a, an even bigger shock. You know, it's if you expect things are, are up and to the right and all of a sudden you find out that in fact they've been collapsing, that's more of a shock to the system and, and the markets respond accordingly. So, you know, you mentioned for a, a moment ago about how, you know, this easy lending. So it turns out that we now have 84 month leases are now 6% of all leases out there. I, c- I come from the business world. I don't come from Wall Street. In the business world, it was pretty straightforward. Your sales team had to bring in the number, right? They got to make the number. And when the number starts getting harder and harder to make, the sales team starts doing what we used to call unnatural acts. Um, we saw this at Wells not too long ago, where all of a sudden Wells is doing unnatural acts yeah. in order to goose up the numbers. <laughs> this is what a sales team does, right? The sales that's team are job. heroes because- <laughs> That's their well, job. <laughs> that's, a, that's their job. They got to bring it in, you know? Uh, you throw them under the bus when things slow down. You know, when things are going up, everyone gets credit all the way up to the CEO, even though it's the salesperson's job to, you know, basically turn the seed into something else. Um, well, what I'm trying to say is 84 year, le- 84 month leases are now 6% of all the cars, I'm sorry, 84 month, uh, not leases, 84 month um, yeah. terms, yeah. loans. Uh, this is called an unnatural act. And you see this because organic so growth. 72, 72. But, yeah. but on the one hand, Andrew, if Joe Sixpack is going to keep his car for seven or eight years, because now these cars will last for a quarter of a million miles, right? Um, but the thing is, he never builds up any equity in it because the end of the eight years, what's the thing worth? Twenty five. Well, any car that runs is worth thirty five hundred to five thousand dollars now, right? Hey, man, you can get a good quality, uh, a good quality Lexus, seven years old. Um, thing never falls apart. You can get that for ten grand, right? So I guess they're pulling in sales. What happens is that this. What, what I guess the point is, when you've peaked, when you've hit that peak. You, you can't slow down. You got to keep the momentum going. And so that's when you start turning it to, well, the natural level of sales slows down. And so you start doing things to, to pull in from future sales. So think about that for a second. If we've already peaked and auto sales are starting to, to slow down and go low, at the same time, they're exhausting all these unnatural acts. The natural level of sales, we peaked a long time ago, you know, maybe a year ago. But that momentum from the sales department to keep that number going, whatever it takes, is is still continuing. But then it stops. And when it stops, it doesn't happen slowly. It happens quickly. And so how do we prepare for these kind of peak moments? What data do we turn and say, aha, it's time? Because the money is made at inflection points. Right now, if you look around the world, every central bank and everyone out there is trying to extend the growth cycle. They're doing whatever they can. You know, China came out with a PMI of 51, and the world went ecstatic. All right, 51 means it's barely growing, and yet the world's thrilled to death. We're at 2% GDP, and somehow the world is thrilled. Okay, we have got no growth, and now it looks like the auto industry is starting to flash those red those red flags of we we left growth a while ago. So what do we want to watch to really anticipate when the markets are going to pick up on this? Because we can't trust CPI. We can't trust retail. I say we trust jobless claims. Can I talk about that a little bit? Yeah, talk about jobless claims a little bit. Okay. So, you know, everyone says that labor is is, uh, the outcome 
of the economy. You know, companies hire and fire based on uh, you know, the state of, of their business. The thing about jobless claims that I like, several things. Number one, they really reflect, the ebb and flow of jobless claims reflects the ebb and flow of construction workers, temp workers, and restaurant workers. These are the hourly workers, the marginal workers, the ones who can easily be moved back and forth. Um, because in today's extraordinarily regulated labor market, it's hard to hire and fire people. But you can do that with these kind of folks. And so what, when you talk about jobless claims, you're not talking about white collar workers, really. Typically, you're talking about the hourly workers out there, the marginal workers, the ones who are the go to when you've got to quickly expand, the ones you go to when you've got to quickly downsize. The thing I like about them is unlike every other data point the government pumps out, this is not modeled data. Someone walked in and said, hey, I don't have a job. And for each individual, you know, you do a little tally. What I've noted is if you go back decades, the precursor to every recession by six to nine months is when jobless claims on a year over year basis hit parity, meaning you're no longer seeing jobless claims fall relative to the prior year. And what does that mean? It means the economy has reached an equilibrium point where it's not really creating more jobs and it's not really firing more people. And really there's nowhere to go but more layoffs. And what happens if you look at jobless claims is it starts like a trickle and then the dam bursts. All of a sudden, jobless claims surge. I don't look at the absolute number. I mean, right now we're at 240 something, which is historically incredibly low. But guess what? Last year, January, we were at 240, 250. In fact, for this entire year, jobless claims have been at 240, 250. What I'm saying is in four months' time, jobless claims will be on a year over year basis. 100%, the exact same level as the prior year. And every single time we've hit that point, Kerry, if, if I said that correctly, let me say that again. Yeah. Every single time, every single business cycle, the recession was preceded six to nine months by this parity. And we're about to see this in four to five months. Now, I talk to institutional uh -huh. investors, hedge funds, and guess what? The chatter right now is recession probably early 2019. So let's use, let's use my, my sort of stake in the ground. When recessions happen, the markets don't wait for the official government to say, oh, geez, look at that, we hit a recession. You know, the market's pretty much six months before the official recession. So you know, if the, if the recession started sometime in December 2007, the market started to trip by the first quarter of 2007. They started to stumble mm -hmm. and gasp. Okay, let's use 2019. So the markets are basically saying, hey, first quarter 2019 is when things really turn down. That means by the summertime next year, next mm -hmm. year, summertime, Q2, Q3, we want to get out of the market. We want to be positioned defensively. Now, I just raised my hand and said, you know what? The turning point is more likely first quarter. So now we've got an advantage over institutional investors because if the jobless claims hold true to their current trajectory, we know that the time to get out is not the summertime. It's actually first quarter. Now, you won't start getting defensive. You think first quarter? What about the concept of getting out now while the going is good? Well, you know, it's weird because, I, first of all, timing a recession is a fool's game. And I am clearly a fool. But having said that. You're timing everything, Andrew. I, I've got to, right? You know, I'm, I'm basically your saying, job, you know, it's like we're, it? driving, we're driving down the highway and the mile marker just showed up. Last so, I heard, it was your job. It's your job, job to time everything. You don't have to. I'm not saying you know top tick, bottom tick. I'm saying start to recognize that unless unless there are big changes. So what could those changes be? Well, war, Tax cut. wars, wars, good for the economy. Trump stimulus finally happening. Well, let's face it. It's how soon is September here? There's no tax thing coming down the pipeline. Trump is in such you know he's fighting fights left, right, and center. The one fight he's not fighting is fiscal stimulus. Not because he doesn't want to, not because he can't. This guy's so distracted, it's not funny. There's so many things that he's dealing with right now. And Congress is, it's September. When they come back, the last thing in their minds they're going to be doing is worrying about anything. They're, they're getting ready to pack up for the holidays. So we do not have a fiscal stimulus plan or a tax cut plan likely for the next, I'll say, six months, easily. So that means there's no shift to the trajectory of jobless claims. And that means that the economy isn't going to get the stimulus. And oh, by the way, the Fed's still talking about raising interest rates. So really? you know, that's called a break on the economy. It's not, it's not a stimulus. It's the exact opposite. And if everyone's on this tightening trajectory, we've got problems ahead. Um, and again, the mile marker just showed up and it's saying, hey, you know what? We're about to hit that point 
that every single recession was preceded by. And guess what? It's all, and, and some of this is self-fulfilling at a certain level. If the, if the institutional fe- investors, the guys with the deep pockets, are already trying to time in a matter of months. Remember, we're talking they expect the market in less than 18 months. They expect a recession, which means that they're already saying, geez, that means 18 months, let's subtract nine because we want to get out before the storm hits. That means that they're already measuring in months when the big money is going to start moving to the sidelines. They're already thinking about it. They're already trying to calibrate their exit point. So be aware um, in terms of where to put your money, geez, man, smarter people than I, but um, I'm sure it's out there. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's some great places that are counter cyclical to put your money. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you know, they say about economists, they call it the uh, eight out of the last uh, five recessions, right? <laughs> hey, and they say the Fed has a perfect batting average for getting it wrong every single time. So um, we know this raising, to be the true, the truth. That, right? see, that we'll see. That's another <laughs> when, the, when the Fed raises rates. Hey, here's a quick here's a quick little kind of put it in the back of your mind. So when the Fed does their game with interest rates, it creates or reduces hot money. If you watch Atlantic City, Atlantic City is a center of gambling. It's also right next to Wall Street. So they get a lot of that hot money flow, or they traditionally have. What's interesting is Atlantic City gambling peaks, the growth of the gambling peaks about 18 months before the Fed starts cutting rates. And it does this, again, every cycle. And it makes sense, you know, when the hot money starts to slow, when, when the hot money gets too hot, the Fed starts to step in and start to increase rates. When the hot money flow starts to slow down, it's picked up in gambling. Because <laughs> let's face it, that's the ultimate hot money, right? Um, and then the Fed does their thing. Right. According to that measurement, the Fed should have raised rates in 2013. That's when the hot money flow at Atlantic City peaked. Now, what's interesting is fast Fast forward, we're at 2017. Guess what that same metric, and by the way, we're talking about going back five to six cycles where it's been consistent, just consistent track record. And because again, gambling is a way of just tracking the real economy mm-hmm. as represented by actual in, people. Indirect measure. Um, indirect measure. Indirect, yeah, but it's it's measuring reality. You're measuring okay. millions of people. I don't have a problem with thing. it. I don't have a problem with it, but Atlantic City is already depressed Atlantic before it depressed. even gets into this recession. The half the casinos are closed and the other half don't know how they're going to stay open. So it's maybe, it's, it's, you measure gambling in general and use this metric. What you find yeah. is 2013 was when the Fed traditionally should have raised rates. Mm-hmm. And today is traditionally when they should be cutting rates. So while they're talking about raising rates, historically speaking, um, the hot money left a long time ago. And now we're looking at the dregs. And this is exactly when the Fed sh- would have, in a traditional non-QE environment, been cutting rates to keep the economy going. Right. So we've got a lot of cross currents. It's very choppy. We've got cross currents politically. Um, none of this is, is going to keep the economy going for much longer. Yeah. Well, hey, um, you know, I can't argue with you. I think uh, the recession's been long overdue, but maybe we never really got out of the Great Recession in a lot of respects. Yeah, real estate prices are peaking now. You know, they're higher than they were before the crash. But the labor force participation rate never kicked up. Home ownership still in the in the downs. And well, I mean, let's, a let's lot stop of right things. there. How how can we possibly say that we got out of a recessionary stage when uh, we were throwing money at everything and we barely get above two percent growth, three percent growth? I mean, come on. We, we we've been able to attain that with zero percent interest rates. It's like it's a shell game, right? And a lot of that again is because we're blowing bubbles and, and you know everybody with any sense is going to sit there and say this is not a normal economy. It will end badly. We know that. Everybody knows that. The, I mean, I, I was looking at Germany the other day. Germany is spending $60 billion a year now just to deal with the uh, million plus migrants who came into their economy. That's called fiscal stimulus. So guess what? Their economy's up. Why? Well, they've got to build apartments. They've got to buy apartments and things like that to house a million people. Of course, the economy's up. They're throwing $60 billion into it. And remember, their economy is a lot smaller than ours. So that $60 billion has a lot more impact. And now you throw in the negative interest rates. And so all of a sudden, the EU is, is, is oh my God, we got half a point GDP. You know, what? You're doing all these things and that's the best you can do? We've gotten to that point where we're pushing string uphill. So when it does break, and it's all based on debt, another data point, if I may carry, M1 supply coming out of China, we're talking debt. 
China's entire economy depends on them throwing money into the system, liquidity. Um, same as ours was 10 years ago. As soon as that liquidity rug gets pulled out from under them, they collapse. And that's not a small thing. Go back to what I said about Germany. German factory orders for this month, good domestically, but there were no exports. Well, Germany depends on exports. Germany depends on exports to China. Why did those exports flatline? If you look at the M1 supply, it started to decrease and it's been pulling down all of the industrial production in, in, in China. So what you've got is if you follow the threads, China is pumping out debt. Every time they slow down, the rest of the world is the tail. I should say the European world is the tail to the Chinese dog. And that Chinese dog is slowing down. We have all these waves converging on slowdown. The U.S. is a little disconnected from the rest of the world. And we're less dependent. Oh, if China decides to have a trade war with us, they buy fewer soybeans. Really? No. Uh, I'd like to see that happen. You know, we're, we're, we're relatively disconnected. And yeah, we're debt fueled. And it's a problem. This is, leverage isn't as bad as it might have been. We, we still know we're blowing bubbles. And we know the government's either deliberately uh, blind um, because they want things I'm to lying. continue yeah. as they are. Um, whatever the case, the U.S. is going to suffer worse, but the rest of the world is going to suffer. And, and I believe that the proximate cause is going to be China slowing down. That hits Asia. It hits Europe. Iron prices collapse because that's what they do. Well, you know, when the Chinese demand slows down, guess what? You know, material prices go down. And you're going to see the, the whole world is going to shiver. We're going to catch the cold, too. And so it's just a question of when. Because when this does slow down, when it does, and we're already starting to see peak in, in the normal state of affairs, even the government's data is showing peak, when, when it starts to slow down, it's not going to slow down and ease like a 1990, 1990 uh, recession, 91. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not going to be one of those take a breath, pause for a couple of quarters. There's so much debt keeping this machine going that when that debt slows, when that liquidity slows, Everything shakes. We're already seeing corporate buybacks slow. And so the stock market's been kind of sluggish lately. Yeah, so. this is all true. And uh, that's what we have to look forward to. Uh, this is why markets... Man, doom and gloom. I uh, doom hey. and gloom today. Yeah, no kidding. Well, this is, um, this is why you need to be prepared for this. Yeah, and, or I'm your best uh, friend. I'm and, giving you the high you know, sign. The Get market. ready. Yeah, the stock market. you got a market. few months to think about it. Yeah, it's it's a dangerous place to be. On the other hand, um, if if uh, they double down and they start issuing even more debt and monetizing it, which I think is what they're going to do, Andrew, more the stock market will continue going higher. It'll have well, nothing notice, to do with earnings. Up. I think I think the 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 metals market twelve seventy two something like that twelve seventy two. They knocked it down yesterday. You know, got a nice little nine ten dollar an ounce. Uh, well, on the down. I like to silver, my friend. I like, yeah, well, I like silver, silver. because it's, it's been um, at that 80, that silver ratio to gold has just been ridiculous. Yeah, oh, low. yeah, it's at 75 um, it plus. 17. Yeah. yeah. It, and, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think yeah. I think they're anticipating some kind of loosening. And, and Oh, yeah. That's it, all they can do here, Andrew. What else are they going to do? And they're not going to just let the economy tank. They're not going to do it. The intervention of... Keynesian or, interventionalism is at its peak right now. Let's, let's they're not going to just Star stop. Trek, let's use that Star Trek four-dimensional chess concept. Maybe they're trying to blow bubbles so that when they do pull back on the reins, you know, okay, so the stock market goes down 10%. It's not a big deal if they've goosed up 10% more, right? Mm -hmm. So you get what you need to get, and then you look like you've done the right you know, and the, and the markets go, okay, great. You allowed a little bit of a correction. It's a meaningful correction. Well, define meaningful. You know, you, you pumped it up too much. Now you let the air out of the tires and everyone applauds you. Um, yeah, it's well, a, I don't know, man. Uh, I'm not Machiavellian enough. Yeah, I don't see that. But in any event, Andrew, uh, definitely going to want to find out more. Where's the best place to find your work? Moneyball Economics, come on down. Um, and also, we got the Moneyball Trader, where we've been doing some. And this this quarter has been fantastic for our ETFs and our stock picking. All right. And uh, questions, comments for Andrew, myself, or anyone else you heard on the show, email address is kl at com. Twitter feed at Lutz. Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Andrew, we'll talk to you again real soon. Be well, my friend. Happy investing, everyone. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. 
It's all about what's next. Understanding what's going on in the economy, and so therefore, what should we focus on so that we as investors have the right data in our hands in a timely way? So inflation, the way they look at it, they say, yeah, we're going to kick out energy and food. You say, okay, that's fine. So of all the things they measure, that kicks out about 20% of the things they measure. So then when you hear CPI is this or CPI is that, typically they're looking at that number that's X energy and food. Okay, so that gives us 80% of the things they measure. They then kick out another 19% because those are those are commodities. So to net it out, you've got 80% of which 20% is commodities, 60% is services. Now, here's the thing. If you look at commodities, we've got Chinese deflation. Everything that China makes and sells to us is constantly falling in price. So when they looked at commodities, they said, oh, look, commodities are falling in price. Well, they've been falling in price for a couple of years now, thanks to China. Appliances, bikes, clothes, we import all that stuff. It's services where you really get the feel for what the U.S. economy is doing because you, know, you, you, you can't substitute a doctor here for a doctor in China. So here's the interesting thing. Every single service item went up dramatically, surging, accelerating inflation. You're talking 60% of all the things that are measured, 60% of the 80% of the things that matter to the Fed. Everything went up with one exception. And the, this is the one thing that brought down inflation where everyone said, oh my gosh, we don't have inflation. Cell phones. According to the people who measure CPI, Cell phone bills dropped 14% year over year, and they've been dropping at that rate for the past year. Now, Carrie, I'm sorry, but I'm not seeing my AT&T cell phone bill go down. In fact, it's always going up. So you've got a methodology problem here. When you start lifting up the hood and poking around, you realize this is garbage. It's garbage data that's influencing decisions, but it's still garbage data. And the same thing happened with retail yesterday. So retail comes out and everyone says, oh, this is great. Retail went up, you know, 0.6%. And this is great because the prior month it was practically 0%. And wow, consumers are out there spending. And I raise my hand. I say, no, 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 no. Let's start with the number one reason why retail went up is they identified this massive surge in car sales. Now, if, if you're alive, if you're able to breathe and you could respond accordingly. So, you know, you mentioned for a moment ago about how, you know, this easy lending. So it turns out that we now have 84 month leases are now 6% of all leases out there. I, I come from the business world. I don't come from Wall Street. In the business world, it was pretty straightforward. Your sales team had to bring in the number, right? They got to make the number. And when the number starts getting harder and harder to make, the sales team starts doing what we used to call unnatural acts. Um, we saw this at Wells not too long ago, where all of a sudden Wells is doing unnatural acts yeah. in order to goose up the numbers. <laughs> this is what a sales team does, right? The sales that's team are job. heroes because- <laughs> That's their well, job. <laughs> that's, that's their job. They got to bring it in, you know? Uh, you throw them under the bus when things slow down. You know, when things are going up, everyone gets credit all the way up to the CEO, even though it's the salesperson's job to, you know, basically turn the seed into something else. Um, well, what I'm trying to say is 84 year, le 84 month leases are now 6% of all the cars. I'm sorry, 84 month, uh, not leases, 84 month um, yeah. terms, yeah. loans. Uh, this is called an unnatural act. And you see this because organic so growth. 72, is 72. But, yeah. but on the one hand, Andrew, if Joe's six pack is going to keep his car for seven or eight years, because now these cars will last for a quarter of a million miles. Right. Um, but the thing is, he never builds up any equity in it because the end of the eight years, what's the thing worth? Twenty five. Well, any car that runs is worth thirty five hundred to five thousand dollars now. Right. Hey, man, you can get a good quality, uh, a good quality Lexus. Seven years old. Um thing never falls apart. You can get that for 10 grand, right? So I guess they're pulling in sales. What happens is that this, what, what, I guess the point is when you've peaked, when you've hit that peak, you, you can't slow down. You got to keep the momentum going. And so that's when you start turning it to, well, the natural level of sales slows down. And so you start doing things to, to pull in from future sales. So think about that for a second. If we've already peaked and auto sales are starting to, to slow down and go low, at the same time, they're exhausting all these unnatural acts. The natural level of sales, we peaked a long time ago, you know, maybe a year ago. But that momentum from the sales department to keep that number going. Would FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and it is 
August, got hard to believe, August 16th, 2017, and almost done with the summer doldrums. But this summer has been anything less than dull, and it's going to heat up soon, guarantee you that. Well, what's with the economy? We get retail sales coming in ahead of estimates. Can you believe it? And what about jobless claims? Well, the expert in jobless claims we know is Andrew Zatlin of MoneyballEconomics.com. Andrew, welcome back. Hey, Kerry. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. So so there's retail sales. Something uh, fishy with that number, isn't there? You know, I'm a mechanic when it comes to this stuff. And, and I, I, I hate conventional data points because most of the time, yeah, they're like 60, 70, 80 years old. And the methodology by which they come up with these numbers, it would blow you away. It's, it's the traditional, if you only knew how they made the sausages, you wouldn't eat one <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, you know, it, they got to do something, right? And governments are trying. And, and, and when you think about it, every month they've got to crank out a survey of, you know, they got to take the pulse of the U.S. economy once a month. This is a pretty big deal. It's it's hard, but I think they could do a better job. And I think yesterday's retail number just showed us how how dangerous we're getting to a place where the official data has disconnected so dramatically from what's really going on. And, you know, it's a slippery slope when you when you poke at one of these data points. I mean, you could you could start with inflation. You know, one of the things about inflation was if you looked at inflation, um, that came out last week and everyone said, oh my gosh, inflation's pretty mild. No, let me correct that. If you look at the way they measure inflation, let me put my mechanics hat on here. I want to start with inflation, then do retail sales, talk a little bit about how these numbers are kind of making making everyone have the wrong under whatever it takes is, is still continuing, but then it stops. And when it stops, it doesn't happen slowly. It happens quickly. And so how do we prepare for these kind of peak moments? What data do we turn and say, aha, it's time because the money is made at inflection points. Right now, if you look around the world, every central bank and everyone out there is trying to extend the growth cycle. They're doing whatever they can. You know, China came out with a PMI of 51 and the world went ecstatic. All right, 51 means it's barely growing and yet the world's thrilled to death. We're at 2% GDP and somehow the world is thrilled. Okay. We have got no growth. And now it looks like the auto industry is starting to flash those red, those red flags of we, we left growth a while ago. So what do we want to watch to really anticipate when the markets are going to pick up on this? Because we can't trust CPI. We can't trust retail. I say we trust jobless claims. Can I talk about that a little yeah, bit? Talk about jobless claims a little bit. Okay. So, you know, everyone says that labor is, is, uh, the outcome of the economy. You know, companies hire and fire based on uh, you know the state of, of their business. The thing about jobless claims that I like, several things. Number one, they really reflect, the ebb and flow of jobless claims reflects the ebb and flow of construction workers, temp workers, and restaurant workers. These are the hourly workers, the marginal workers, the ones who can easily be moved back and forth. Um, because in today's extraordinarily regulated labor market, it's hard to hire and fire people. But you can do that with these kind of folks. And so what, when you talk about jobless claims, you're not talking about white collar workers, really. Typically, you're talking about the hourly workers out there, the marginal workers, the ones who are the go to when you've got to quickly expand, the ones you go to when you've got to quickly downsize. The thing I like about them is unlike every other data point the government pumps out, this is not modeled data. Someone walked in and said, hey, I don't have a job. And for each individual, you know, you do a little tally. What I've noted is if you go back decades, the precursor to if you read any kind of media, you know that, in fact, auto companies are struggling. They're choking. Right now. You know, choking on the inventory, the channel oh stuffing God. and everything else. They don't know what the heck to do here, Andrew, with all the all the metal that they've got uh, on the yeah. lots. They can't move the metal. GM has some factory shutdowns. I mean, there's too much car out there, not enough buying. In fact, if you look at the government's own data from the BEA, no less, they said, let's, let's start with a couple of data points here to frame up why this is so ludicrous, how CPI is messy, but so is retail. And, and so what isn't messy? Uh, retail sales, they said there's about $1.2 billion increase in auto sales. Huh. But their own data says that there were exactly 90,000 more cars sold from Ju uh, June to July, only 90,000. But somehow that became 1.2 billion. And the other data point is the average car 
net price, retail price dropped. Um, yeah, the incentives more incentives. to a new high. Yeah, new in- yeah. more incentives. Uh, but the average car price actually went down. Yeah. The average transaction per right. unit went down because they've got too many cars out well, there. Well, look, Andrew, so, Andrew, like the average, I met some people, they had spent $65,000 on a Ford, tricked out Ford F-150. I mean, the profit margin on that vehicle has got to be the highest margin vehicle that Ford had, uh, other than uh, their huge trucks. And, you know, like, come on, they've got a lot. They took this opportunity of loosened credit standards to jack up the prices. Since you don't care because you're borrowing it anyway, it's such low interest rates. And this Uh thing's got a boomerang at some point, right? Let's talk about this. Okay, so what I just presented, CPI and retail, uh, the official conventional data is not reflecting the real world. So what does that mean? It means two things. It means, number one, decisions are being made by the Federal Reserve and by others based on flawed data which is good if you're an investor, because the second part is we're going to know better. All right. So the opportunity to be in the right position, because you're going to have an even bigger shock. You know, it's if you expect things are are up and to the right and all of a sudden you find out that, in fact, they've been collapsing. That's more of a shock to the system and and the 